I've just shown you a nice attacking game by Boris Baskia, and now I'd like to look at a game played by Bobby Fischer from roughly the same time in 1970. So while Spassky was winning a tournament in Amsterdam, Fischer was across the other side of the world playing in a tournament in Buenos Aires in Argentina. And in the very first round, Fischer faced the Soviet representative Vladimir Tukmarkov, who at that time was a rising star. Now, we know that Fischer said in his games collection, My 60 Memorable Games, Pawn King 4, best by test. So what did Fischer do in round one against Tukmarkov? He played 1b3. Now I have no doubt at all that Fischer was influenced by Bent Larsen, who used this move to great effect uh, in the years between sort of 1968 and 1972. He played a lot and he had fantastic results with it. I know he lost to Spassky in 17 moves. We've seen that video already. You can find it, the, the link in the description. Um, but in fact, Larson was very successful with, with uh, 1b3. And Fischer must have thought, hmm, I could try that too. So, took Markov answer with e5, putting a pawn in the centre of the board. Can't be wrong. Fischer attacked it and the pawn was defended with knight c6. It's funny how our openings go in and out of fashion. The moment b3 has had a bit of a resurgence among the top players as they're looking for openings where they don't um, have to encounter reams of uh, computer preparation. And so b3 has come back into fashion. You might recall the game between Karyakin and Giri from the Leuven Grand Chess Tour tournament. Uh, where Karyakin played e3 here, but instead Fischer played c4, and he wants to play a kind of Sicilian. Of course, that was in his blood, the Sicilian with black. And here, you might remember, is where Larsen played very provocatively with knight f3 and lost that very quick game against Spassky. But Fischer played e3, a much sounder move. In fact, Larsen and Spassky played this exact position a couple of months after that rest of the world match. And um, Spassky actually played d5 here. And, well, the game went like this. And, and basically, they just got a reverse Sicilian position and the game ended in a draw. And I think d5 is the, well, the... the the most straightforward way for black to play the position. It's a reverse Sicilian, basically. But Tukmarkov played more conservatively with bishop e7, so it's not on such an active square. And Fischer was just content to play, um, well, typical Sicilian moves, you could say. Um, with d3 here, Fischer actually repeated this and played queen c2 against Anderson a little later in the year, but anyway, on this day he played d3 so he's just ready to play knight f3 and yeah simple development but it's basically a sicilian reversed and here is where took markov opened up the position black does not need to do that you could for example just play rook e8 in this position but d5 played and if knight takes d5, then white actually has quite a nice position already because it's, it's a bit awkward defending that pawn. You don't, of course, you can play f6, but you don't really want to play in such a passive way um, protecting the, 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 the e pawn like this because, you know, you want to be driving forward with f5. But still, I think that's actually a better way for black to play than the game continuation. So Markov played queen takes d5. So what he wants to do is to attack this pawn on d3 very quickly. But actually, it's really easy for white to defend this just by putting the rook on d1. If black could break with e4, that would uh, help. But... Fischer has the e4 square covered by all those pieces. 
So Tugmarkov's next move, h6, I think is already an indication that, well, he, he stuck for an active plan. Of course, he's preparing if the bishop is attacked to drop it back here, but h6, it's a bit of a nothing move. Fischer played h3, he could also just play um, bishop b2 there. And I wonder whether he was toying with the idea of playing g4 in that position. You could do, actually. But Fischer just rules out anything with e4, so this is a good move. Everything's still protected. d3 is protected by bishop and by queen. It's actually very hard for, for black to get anywhere against this kind of hedgehog setup. And Fisher castles here. Here he just castles. Um, he could have played g4. I, in some ways I'm surprised he didn't do this because the king is perfectly safe in the middle of the board. If necessary, it can move over to the king side, but in playing g4, it gives you nice control over f5, which means that the knight is completely secure on the square e4. Um, and you could look to play h4 and g5, and Fischer employed a very similar strategy against Anderson, an exhibition game I mentioned earlier. But Fischer just castled here. So, yeah, he, a much calmer move, very interesting. And bishop g6 from Tukmarkov, he's making room for the f-pawn. But it is pretty slow. So basically we have a reversed Sicilian. The structure is typical of a Sicilian, with colours reversed. But Fischer is very comfortable here because uh, Tukmarkov doesn't have any kind of attack, so th th these pawns have developed nice space on the queen side, nice uh, minority attack, some pressure is building on the c-file, and this extra centre pawn just shuts out black's pieces. So Fischer is already in his element in this position. f5. So that takes away this square here, but it also opens black's position as well. Um, absolutely typically, although when black presses forward, or white in the case of the colours reversed, often it creates a lot of weaknesses behind those pawns. And well, watch out for the weakness of this diagonal, and not just that diagonal. Fischer starts the initiative on the queen side, so he's moving towards, he's looking to, to play knight here and then knight in c5. So for example, if knight b6 here, well, you could play bishop f3, but let's just go in straight away. It's nice to grab the bishops. You could play queen takes here, but I quite like pawn takes. And knight c4, well, white would perhaps like to drop the bishop back to a1 and then put the rook on the b-file, attacking the pawn on b7. And don't forget, you know, there could be some pressure on this long diagonal now that black's dark squared bishop has been removed from the board. And yeah, well, it, two bishops... Nice center. I think white white is already slightly better there. Tomokov played knight a7. I mean, I really don't like that move at all. Going backwards. And Fischer continued his queenside initiative. And so obviously he wants to come in c5. Um, but but also there's the idea to play d4 sometimes as well. And in fact, after b6, d4 is incredibly strong. Typical break. Um, pawn on a6 is on prees, but also white is obviously crashing through the middle of the board. 
For example, if e4, e4 is the move we would like to play to keep the structure closed, but well, d5 is just incredibly strong. And we'll take a pawn there, and, and black's position is collapsing. So Tukmokov played f4. The bishop threatens the queen. But e4 is a very strong move. And now this introduces another possibility, and that's playing the bishop out to g4, uh, sometimes even to c4 as well, and black's queen is in some trouble. And, well, let's not forget this one too. Let me just show you a... a uh, some a tactical variation. I suspect that somewhere around here took Markov had miscalculated um, because he collapses so quickly. Let's just have a look at bishop takes pawn. Uh, there are some interesting tactics here. So queen takes bishop and queen takes knight. That's the point. So black has won a pawn in inverted commas, but actually it leaves his position in a wreck. So bishop takes pawn is actually very strong. Maybe this is what took Markov had miscalculated. Perhaps he assumed that black would be doing fine here. Well, let's see um, what happens if the rook moves. Then white can just crash through the middle of the board. So at the moment, white is a piece down. But actually, once this happens, opening up this diagonal and don't forget this one dropping back here. It is absolutely fatal. Uh, for example, if knight f6, let's exchange rooks. Take here e7. And then bishop here is absolutely fatal. Uh, you can see these pieces have absolutely no bearing on the position at all. Um, well, that's just one possible variation, but it just shows you that uh, the, the tactics just don't work for black. Took Markov played knight b5, but then bishop g4. If the queen drops back here, then we just take on e5. Thank you. Queen f6. But now some simple exchanges. Fisher wins rook for bishop, and now he wins even more uh, through this pin here. I mean, this is absolutely horrible attacking here. So Tukmarkov at this point decides to resign, and not before time. Um, yeah, his position is just collapsing completely. So 26 moves, an absolute wipeout, and um, it seemed to me that, well, Tukmarkov made a couple of pretty bad errors. I think the first one was playing too timidly with bishop e7. And then having done that to open the position um, and even to recapture the queen, he got his strategy just completely wrong and gave Fisher just a typical Sicilian position without any um, kind of counterplay at all. So there we go, Fisher successful with 1b3, and he did use it a couple of times later in the year as well. Perhaps we'll have a look at those some other time. Um, don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe. And if you hit the subscribe button, you can hit the bell as well, and that gives you instant notification of when I post more videos. Thanks for watching.